my presentation tonight is called Unificationism, the Way of Filial Piety. And uh, it's based just on my personal reflection and notes. So I'd like to give an overview of the principle of creation, uh, the understanding of the human fall and restoration history. Uh, filial piety is the love and respect children return in response to the love of their parents. So unificationism, or sometimes called Godism, views God as a parent of all humanity. And it embraces all faith as having a role in realizing the providential will of God. For example, Old and New Testaments are understood as divine revelation of God, but not necessarily all the doctrines resulting from traditional interpretations. Unificationism is best explained in the divine principle, which is a systematic compilation from Reverend Moon's lectures uh, written in 1945 from two sources, Wally Kangrong and Wally Hal Su. <clears throat> so fundamental to unificationism is the notion of who is God. God is seen as creator and parents of all humankind, the origin of both masculinity and femininity. And God is a loving parent. God is fundamentally love. And God is the God of redemption and restoration who is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. God is our eternal parent and subject or initiating partner in a subject object relationship in the realm of heart. <clears throat> so in Paul's writings of Romans 8, he mentions that Christ is to be the firstborn among many brothers. And also in Corinthians that we have borne the image of the earthy, meaning earthy Adam, will also bear the image of the heavenly Adam. So um, divine principle talks about the image of God. And what is that image of God? I'd like to share that fundamental notion from the principle of creation. If we think about Romans 128, it says that the eternal power and deity of God is clearly manifested in the things that have been made. So what do we notice about everything that is part of creation? Things exist with an internal character and an external form. And these are realized through the duality of masculinity and femininity. If I give an example, I would say minerals have certain invisible characteristics like the laws of physics and chemistry, but also a substantial form in particles, atoms, molecules, and it builds up from there. So we could say that they are realized with positivity and negativity. In addition, plants have a plant internal nature, some kind of sensitivity as well as a cell body. Animals have still a higher level of sensitivity and instinct and some kind of consciousness, uh, which is realized in masculinity and femininity, as well as a body with the ability of movement, a cell body. Human beings, which are understood as the pinnacle of creation, are realized with a spiritual aspect, as well as a complex physical body. So in my conclusion, human beings, male and female, are designed together to be a microcosm of the universe with all the characteristics of the universe, as well as the direct object partner of God. You might say vehicle of God's presence in creation. So who are we to God? We are the children of God, destined to be the dwelling place of divine spirit. From a unification viewpoint, we could say that God meant to experience the wonder of his creation through the human presence. To do this, we need to reflect the nature of the creator. And we've understood God as a God of personality and power. God is a God of heart and love, but also with the power to re realize the entire creation, the cosmos. <clears throat> so that's a harmony of internal character and external form. That there's a harmony original masculinity and the original femininity of all creation we call original parents. And finally, God's role is that of creator in relationship to the creation 
uh, subject and object, initiator and reciprocator relationship with the entire creation, a true ownership. So the human, human beings are meant to be co-creators in the image of God by realizing their responsibility. It's described in Genesis 1.28 as responsibility to the first human ancestors, Adam and Eve, and also in Genesis 9.1 to Noah. Be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. These are understood as the three blessings. So these are essential to become an object partner of goodness for the joy of God. It's realized when an individual centering on the will of God has thought and action. And in so doing, thought and action becoming a true person where God can dwell in that person. And that is a personal victory. Um, <clears throat> A person of that kind of quality can become a true husband or a true wife. And through their interactions centered upon the will of God, will realize a true family in which the development of heart, of children's love, siblings' love, conjugal love between husband and wife, and finally parents' love will develop, realizing a, a family victory of the presence of God living in families that have received his blessing and received his lineage to become, in a sense, a royal family, a pattern of true tribes, true society, true nation, and true world. And then true families centering on that ideal of God would have give and take with the substantial creation to realize an ideal world of common cause, co-prosperity, common values. In other words, God would live in that world of true ownership. So I've kind of summed it by saying families who fulfill the ideal of creation are a microcosm, a center of harmony for the whole creation, true objects of absolute love and joy for God and qualified co-creator of goodness by realizing this responsibility of the three blessings. The purpose of creation in short is the realization of a home of love for you, for your eternal partner, and even for the creator, the source of love. <clears throat> Unificationism emphasized this purpose of creation so strongly because this is the part of human responsibility and human history that has not been realized. Instead, the royal lineage was lost and the human fall took place. The Bible testifies to this in many places, dropping kind of hints about the loss of true lineage. There's a false root of love, false lineage, false love, self-centered life that is alien to God. Therefore, the human ancestors are warned, it mentions in Genesis 2.17, and the day you eat of the fruit, you'll surely die. First Corinthians explains that in Adam all died. In Christ, a new Adamic figure, all can be made alive. In John 3, Jesus explains, except a man be born again, which is in a sense a change of lineage, he cannot see the kingdom of God, even though it's a spiritual lineage. John 8, 44, he said of his detractors that you are of your father, the devil, an evil lineage. So the fall brought about a consequence of ignorance, ignorance of the love of God, and the loss of God's divine sovereignty through the corruption of lineage. Peoples became slaves to sin. And it brought about the result of God's sorrow. In Genesis 6, 6, it says that he repented. He was sorry that he'd even created man. Jeremiah 9, 1 explains that for the prophet to express the heart of God, his eyes would need to be the fountain of tears. In Ezekiel 16, it talks about infidelity of, of his chosen people, and the unrequited love of God investing and investing and receiving nothing back. So there are many indications of a loss of lineage through the fall, but one very significant and simple indication is in the second and third chapters of Genesis, where it says, you know, 
do not eat the fruit. In the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die, as I mentioned. Before the fall, the first human ancestors are naked and unashamed. But after the fall, they're ashamed. And they, as a response, cover their lower parts, which indicates the guilt of the loss of true lineage. So the history of restoration from the unification point of view is the restoration of Adam's role, the restoration of the first human ancestors and the purpose of the Garden of Eden to become God's object partners. At the Old Testament time, it's a restoration of the lineage through Abraham's descendants to receive an Adam figure. They reverse the conditions of the fall through keeping the covenant. And from the time of Jesus, rebirth was available. But this spiritual salvation as a matter through faith was not realizing the substantial kingdom of God on earth. Therefore, there's an explanation on the principle of dispensational time identity. That the New Testament age is an age to reestablish the foundation of the Old Testament age for a new Adamic figure. And finally, the completed Testament age is the final restoration of true families receiving God's blessing and the kingdom of God on earth and in the realm of spirit. Our unificationism holds that total salvation is the will of God. Everyone who ever lived, as well as everyone who's living in the present or the future, all will finally be reconciled. So why unificationism? The quest for God, for the kingdom where the divine will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So realizing the kingdom of heaven is something that will be done through human responsibility to live in the realm of heart. <clears throat> the realm of heart is the fulfilling fulfillment stage of, of, of growth and attendance to live with God in a subject object relationship through filial piety in a life of attendance to our heavenly parents. And uh, this way of heart and attendance reverses the effects of the human fall completely. The sovereignty of God, our heavenly parent, is restored. Total salvation, the restoration of all humanity and all of creation, even the angels, everything is finally realized according to God's original ideal of creation. So I realize this is a very, very quick introduction so I suggest some resources for your further studies. One of them is As a Peace-Loving Global Citizen, an autobiography by the Reverend Dr. Sam Young Moon. Another, A Mother of Peace, and God Shall Wipe Away All Tears from Their Eyes. This is a memoir by Mrs. Moon, Hak Chahan Moon. Also, the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity published an exposition of divine principle which is the latest edition uh, available. And I also think that if you'd like to have a study of, of the heart of Jesus and how the Bible really tells us about prophecy and the life of Jesus, um, an excellent job has been done by Casey McCarthy in his book, Realizing Jesus, what the Bible tells us about Jesus. So I'd like to thank you for your patient listening. And... Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. So I understand the way that you can ask a question is at the bottom of the reactions. You can um, see it says raise hand. If you'll raise your hand, we'll recognize you and give you a chance to ask a question. Thank you. Um, we have you unmute uh, and go ahead and ask your question, Ms. Kirby. My question is, does your faith Believe in the Holy Trinity. There is a chapter, a discussion on Trinity. And um, <clears throat> is it exactly the triune understanding? Not exactly. Yes. But let me explain. If Adam and Eve had fulfilled the will of God and become the true son and daughter of God without falling, then God's creation for Adam and Eve would have been the nucleus of blessing. 
when Jesus restored the position of a true Adam and the Holy Spirit, they became the central Trinity for God's providential will. And so, yes, the essence of Trinity. But um, we have to, I have to say that this is not the classical understanding of triune understanding, okay? okay. But it is an understanding of Trinity, yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. More questions, please? Yes, Mr. Modell, would you unmute and ask your question? Thank you so much. Um, what are one or two criteria uh, for us to appreciate that this, um, that this restoration is happening throughout society? Um, some criteria are, first of all, a Adamic figure appears. We believe that true parents are giving the blessing of marriage to um, basically all humanity now. And so what we're seeing is a, a development not only in history, like we, we talk about the New Testament age as, as echoing that of the foundation of the Old Testament age and that coming to a completion in this century, but we could also talk about in modern times, present times, how the number of blessed families is, is, is growing and how um, this idea of a sphere of co-prosperity, common values, common cause is, is emerging now. And so in a sense, uh, God's providence is ultimately to realize the blessing of all mankind to become true families. And he's working through every different religion to do this. And we see this substantially in the leadership that has actually joined this role uh, from many, many different uh, religious backgrounds to support the idea of blessed families. Thank you. More questions? Hmm. I have a question then. <laughs> what is your dream for a vision for your family and for your children? What, what would you hope? What would be the, the vision that you have for your family to realize the, the greatest dream? Yes. That's my great. dream would be for all of my children to be saved. And when we have the judgment day, that they will all be able to go to heaven and that they will live out their life here on earth with no respect to colors and nationalities, but they would love all of God's children, black men and white men and red men and brown men, that we would all be able to uh, live together without racism and prejudicial thinking and that they would just be uh, citizens who just participate in the society, love God, love their families, and just participate in making the communities that we live in a wonderful God-fearing place. That's my yeah. dream. Sounds good. As a matter of fact, it seems like you also feel like a certain standard of heart is necessary, that we need to love as God loves, and we need to you know, oh. embrace people way beyond any of the differences that we, as, uh, you know, as uh, people who have a broken history, might you know, look at um, each other in that kind of way. So that when we, we see it as God sees it, and we grow to that kind of level of maturity, then we can live automatically in a world of goodness through, you know, in, in encountering each other on that level of love and maturity. Oh, we have a chat from Mr. Mark Anderson. He says, yes, eventually all of God's children must be restored. Oops, let me pick that chat up. God is a loving parent of all mankind beyond any race, religion, or nationality. Uh, good point, Mr. Anderson, wherever you are. I don't see him, but, oh, there he is. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, uh, any more questions occur to anybody? Um, so, um, yes, please. Sure. Um, what are, uh, what are one or two uh, prime ways that the individual 
uh, can bring about the, uh, the ultimate state uh, that unificationism espouses to? Oh, thank you. It's an excellent question, Mr. Modell. Um, I think the important thing is, first of all, to regain awareness, to study God's word, and to understand um, who God is and God's heart. Unificationism is unique in that it expresses about the sorrowful heart of God. That as a true parent, he cannot realize his ideal. And it's God's painful heart. We need to live in such a way as to liberate the heart of God to comfort the heart of God. And as we grow in maturity, we finally can enter this realm of heart through, as um, Ms. Kirby mentioned, through loving others with the heart of God and through gaining that kind of personal maturity. So it is a question of development of heart. Finally, we determine our own situation. We, we believe actually that God doesn't create hell it's the lack of maturity and it's, it's actually we who create our own pain and suffering in the afterlife, but that God finally will resolve everyone and bring everyone to the level of his heart. And uh, finally, any, any parent is that way, you know, any parent can't stand the idea of the loss of even one child. So personally, what we can do is grow in our understanding and love and appreciation for others, live public lives of selflessness and embrace the will of God. Thank you. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful question. More questions. Um, I have one for you then. What can we do to realize world peace? <laughs> Kathy, are you saying something? It looks like I, would you like to unmute and mention? I am. I'm talking out loud. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, we can, right? Can is the operative word. We can achieve world peace. As humans, we can achieve anything we want. I had eye surgery a couple weeks ago. I'm good. Um, the question is really, do we want to, right? right? That becomes a bigger issue, I think, because then if, if we really wanted to, instead of what feels like paying lip service, we would all focus our energies on achieving such a thing. Even if it's small baby steps or incremental steps, toward achieving such a wonderful goal, um, you know, with, with, similar, with similar concepts, of course, no racism, no prejudice against any group, love for all human beings. My mama taught me that there's one race in the world and it's the human race and we're all a part of it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I swear, that's it, growing up in Chicago. And um, I grew up with, you know, just, that's, that was my experience having my best friend still is black to this day back in, we've been best friends since 86. Right. And I love that I was raised in the atmosphere that my mother would say to my sister and I, if you judge a book by its cover, it's your loss. And that that's not, that's not ever a good thing to do. It's not okay. You don't know what that person's made of. And uh, so I, I really believe in, in those principles, but I, I, I want to see like, what are we directing our energies toward to make that happen? That's what I've got. Thank you for asking me to share. Oh, thank you for your wonderful sharing. Not only that, <laughs> but I think it's the parents always have a unique aspect of peace, right? Parents see it differently. Uh, yes. and, they, and, and when we inherit that parental heart, we become really renewed. I noticed that recently uh, Mrs. Moon has been holding um, public rallies with millions of people online. You know, it's kind of difficult to bring millions of people together in any physical place, but because of the pandemic, we've learned that online is possible. And uh, therefore um, it's possible to unite people of, of religion, first of all, because they, they have a desire to realize the will of God and they can quickly see that peace is the way. So I really, I have hope 
that a unity of different religions, um, people of faith, is going to be very, very helpful in realizing the dispensational will of God to bring peace, co-prosperity, common values, healing. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, I like the family suggestion uh, of your religion. In, in the family dynamic, we're constantly trying to understand uh, the other family member and listen to them and, uh, and, and come to grips with their point of view. And th that, as you say, that takes uh, maturity. Uh, then if, uh, if two family members can do that, then they can work out a dilemma. But then if, if we can take that philosophy and apply it in societal situations, and here I'm thinking of what's happening in Myanmar, uh, where you have two different points of view and both of them no doubt believe that they're right. And if, uh, if, if people could listen to the other side, nod their head a few times uh, and say, here's my point of view. Uh, and then um, perhaps it'll take uh, representatives um, to listen, uh, which would be the start of it. And then uh, develop some kind of um, dialogue between them then that can be uh, a start, a start to establishing peace. Mm -hmm. True. It have to be replicated many times over. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So Mr. Anderson, I guess we're commuting through the chat. He says, if all people in the world had an attitude and heart of people on this call, world peace would be easy. Unfortunately, he says there are others who are filled with anger, resentment, and hate. So we have to protect ourselves from these people. How to deal with them is a challenge to creating world peace. But I think, as you mentioned, um, if we had like an, I don't know, able type peace organization, like a United Nations of understanding and common faith, you know, if we could, you know, counsel and encourage people, um, like a surrounding, you know, we, we can't interfere directly because it's a matter of sovereignty. But if there could be this kind of embrace like brothers and sisters, encouraging people towards uplifting peace and common values, I think this would be a very, very big progress in, in history and something that's doable. But I think people of faith really have to see their, their faith as practiced and, and uh, lived in, in their daily life and applicable for the beneficial future of all humanity. I'm not sure. It looks like they're bringing our recording to an end. Does anyone have one last? Oh, oh, yeah. he's gonna. We have to stop. Yeah, he he, he gave the Thank you. one minute warning. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.